It's all gone horribly, horribly wrong. Without so much as a warning, life hangs in the balance. Human endeavor turns to chaos. And within seconds, nothing will ever be the same. Ever. From the far reaches of the globe to the safety of your living room, it's 30 minutes of mind-boggling destruction. In the Persian Gulf, the Sheik of Qatar barely avoids catastrophe when his race boat careens violently off course. A seaplane in Alaska crashes while taking off just feet from an amateur cameraman. It's TV so explosive, you might want to back up from your screen because things are about to be destroyed in seconds. Time to ditch the nerves and let the adrenaline occupy your mind. A powerboat race in the middle of the desert. The Arab Emirate of Qatar is surrounded on three sides by the Persian Gulf, offering an ideal location for the 2005 UIM Class 1 World Powerboat Championships. These dual hull race boats can hit speeds of up to 170 miles per hour. Each five-ton vessel is operated by a driver and a throttle man. One navigates and steers, while the other controls the power. It's a fine balancing act, and one of the reasons why at least one offshore powerboat racer is killed every year. Making it one of the deadliest sports, not just on the water, but on the planet. Racing in the 96 boat are throttle man Matteo Nicolini and driver Sheikh Hassan. Sheikh Hassan, with the weight of a nation's expectancy on his shoulders. It's lap one. Go, the command from Saeed Hareb, releasing a combined total of 20,000 brutal horsepower into the now customary and frantic drag race from Art 1 and 96 immediately into dangerously close encounters with 77 who drop back. 96, everything on the line, raising the bar, but that is where it is all gonna end. It's all gone horribly, horribly wrong for the championship leaders. That's a massive, massive crash. As the Sheik's boat tries to take the number two position, it nearly collides with number 77 from Australia. 77 drops back, disappearing into the massive wash. The Sheik's boat then moves to overtake the leader, number 55 from Norway, but ends up bumping their hull. And that's all it takes to send the vessel flying. The combined wash created by the Sheik's boat and boat 55 also causes Australia's 77 boat to go airborne. And look at that, 77 almost blown over by the power of their wash. For several seconds, 77 appears to be lost. In the air, a long time before coming down the right way up. 96, not so lucky. Rescue teams respond in seconds. The boat! Lying lifeless in the water. Sheikh Hassan and Mateo race to exit the flooding cockpit. Well, the crew of 96 emerging safely from their escape hatch. Mateo walks away uninjured. And desperate frustration for Sheikh Hassan. But Sheikh Hassan suffers a neck injury. Broken and inconsolable. A Qatar team in despair. Their boat is disqualified as a result of the crash. Looking in good shape on the outside, but inside he'll be burning. The Sheik's injury is minor, and days later, he returns to racing. Despite being involved in this crash, dangerously close encounters with 77, and almost blowing over, the 77 boat from Australia goes on to take first place. That is where it is all gonna end. It's all gone horribly, horribly wrong for the championship leaders. July 5th. 2007. Two separate explosions at the same time rock a natural gas pipeline in the Mexican state of Guanajuato. 
The blasts are not accidents, but deliberate acts of destruction. A terrorist group calling itself the Popular Revolutionary Army, or EPR, claim responsibility. Their pledge? To punish wealthy elitists and government officials for keeping much of Mexico in poverty. Tactics include bombing banks, retail stores, and as in this case, pipelines. In the town of Salamanca, the EPR bomb a section of an 8,700 mile long natural gas pipeline. The pipeline is owned by Pemex, Mexico's state-owned oil company. Emergency crews arrive on the scene, but the vapor-fueled flames cannot be put out with water. All fire crews can do is wait for a distant valve to be shut off and for the remaining gas in the line to burn itself out. 30 miles away in the city of Salea, another section of the same pipeline is bombed. At this location, authorities are not able to access the gas flow shutoff valve. The result? Giant fireballs ignite and reach nearly 1,000 feet into the sky. The inferno in Salea flares through the next day. It takes almost 48 hours for the blaze to finally burn itself out. Everything within 100 feet of the blast site is incinerated. No one is injured, but the explosions shut down natural gas delivery to more than 90 manufacturing plants in central Mexico and affect nearly 1,200 companies. The result? Millions of dollars in losses. Kentucky. Motocross sensation Jeremy Stenberg, who goes by the nickname Twitch, competes in a freestyle motocross final. He nails backflip after backflip, executing each stunt with expert precision. Nearing the end of his routine, Twitch goes for one last backflip but it turns out to be one backflip too many. Twitch hits the launch ramp going too fast. He realizes he's going to overshoot his landing spot and lets go of the handlebars. He falls 35 feet onto the hard packed dirt. Twitch is conscious, but he can't move his legs. Both are broken, and the motocross sensation undergoes five surgeries. Doctors tell him he'll never ride again. But Twitch not only rides again, he jumps again. And goes on to win numerous titles, including several X Game gold medals. Twitch continues to ride today and even competes again at the site of this accident. Oh! April 22nd, 2009. A raging fire envelops an industrial building in Villa Martelli, Argentina. Like any mid-sized city, this suburb of Buenos Aires has seen many fires over the years. But firefighters are especially concerned about this one. Knowing that the highly flammable chemicals stored inside could explode at any second. The plant is filled with tanks of combustible liquids such as dithylamine, a corrosive chemical used for making resins and dyes. 
Concerns grow that the fire might quickly spread between the tightly packed buildings. Firefighters douse the inferno as flames shoot through the roof. They're careful to keep a safe distance. Fearful, more chemical tanks will ignite. The firefighters narrowly escape injury from the explosion. After several hours, it appears the mid-afternoon blaze is finally under control. But there's one final blast. When flames finally do subside, the chemical plant is a total loss. Despite fiery explosions fueled by toxic chemicals, injuries are minimal. The cause of the fire remains in question, but there's no doubt memories of this explosive afternoon will reverberate for years. The 1,500-foot-high Petronas Towers are the second tallest buildings in the world and the perfect site for the first international base jumping championships. 70 jumpers each take the leap from 73 floors up. One of them is British base jumper Pierre Pascal. Pierre hopes to walk away from his jump a world champion. But he'll be lucky to walk away at all. Jumping from 1,100 feet, Pierre reaches 71 miles per hour, then deploys his chute. His lines are twisted, and his parachute opens backward, swinging Pierre around and slamming him into the 33rd floor of the building. Pierre manages to recover. He descends towards the landing spot, his crew unaware of his injuries. On landing, event officials move in to check on his condition. To everyone's surprise, Pierre suffers only minor injuries. After landing, Pierre is not only done for the day, he's done for good. After this jump, he decides to retire from base jumping. Fans pack the stands at the Famoso Raceway in Bakersfield, California for the 2009 March meet. It's a qualifying run. In the red, white, and blue dragster is veteran racer Dan Horan. After a five-year absence, he's coming out of retirement for today's event. His opponent in the silver car is Mike Chrisman, driving in his first professional Nostalgia Top Fuel race. quickly approach 200 miles per hour. At half track, Dan collides with his opponent at 190 miles per hour. The impact sends both cars slamming into opposing concrete barriers. Dan is knocked unconscious. With his foot still on the gas, he accelerates to 220 miles per hour. His left rear tire flies off, nearly hitting a photographer and causing the cameraman to run for cover. The impact sends Mike on the right into the right side wall. Through the smoke, he veers across the track and deploys his parachute. Within seconds, rescue crews rush to both men. Mike is bruised, but otherwise uninjured. He exits the wreckage under his own power. At the end of the track, Dan is unconscious for five minutes. He suffers broken ribs, a fractured vertebrae, and a concussion. Mike is currently rebuilding his car. As for Dan, 
This crash convinces him to hang up his racing gloves for good. Alaska's Lake Hood seaplane base is the busiest of its kind, handling over 190 flights a day. Amateur videographer Dustin Kohler is shooting takeoffs and landings. Dustin positions himself on the edge of the bank, in the path of the plane, unaware of the danger that he's put himself in. Oh. Holy. Upon takeoff, the pilot pulls up too soon causing the back end of the plane's pontoons to drag too deeply in the water and slowing acceleration. The pilot states that he feels a sudden gust of wind. He tries to compensate by quickly turning right. The cameraman ducks only inches away from the wing. The plane, with the pilot's entire family on board, nosedives into the dirt. The aircraft suffers major damage to the wings, fuselage, floats, propeller, and motor. Luckily, everyone on board is able to walk away uninjured. Holy October 2002. The west coast of Mexico braces itself for Hurricane Kenna, the strongest storm to hit the country in decades. Kenna makes landfall as a Category 4 storm with winds reaching 140 miles per hour. In the resort town of Puerto Vallarta, a hotel is pounded by a storm surge nearly 10 feet above normal tide levels. Outside, some cling to whatever they can to avoid being swept away. 60 miles north, TV reporter Jeff Mackley enters the small town of Villa Hidalgo. He sets up his camera along some closed storefronts. The 140 mile per hour winds rip away pieces of the building's roof. Whoa! Extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous situation here. Mackley continues to shoot, unaware that a section of the building's third floor is growing weaker by the second. Mackley is nearly crushed by falling debris. He moves to what he believes is a safer location. After the last close call, Mackley seeks refuge in his car. It's pretty wild out here. I dare not leave the car in case I get killed. Hopefully the eye will show up shortly and uh, give me a few minutes to uh, get the hell out of here. The hurricane moves inland and eventually loses strength. Four deaths and more than a hundred injuries are reported. Mackley considers himself lucky not to be a part of those statistics. As you can see, it's really the only, it's the only clear spot. Total damages from Hurricane Kenna are estimated at $50 million. I'm Ron Pitts. We'll see you next time on Destroyed in Seconds. It is all good.